Good morning. Welcome back to the second lecture. Welcome back to the second lecture with Dr. Ian Proven uh, on Were the Reformers Wrong? Some Reflections on Protestant Biblical Interpretation. And our second title is Empty Speculations and Froth. Uh, let's welcome uh, Dr. Proven back. I like that. That's really good. Okay. Thank you. So, in the second lecture, I want to turn our attention away from the literal reading of Scripture towards the allegorical or spiritual reading, as it's nowadays um, often called. This was a way of reading Scripture much favored by many of the church fathers. And then throughout the Middle Ages, when it became customary in the Western church, and indeed more broadly, to distinguish four senses that Scripture might be held to possess. These senses are briefly described in a Latin poem attributed to the early monk and theologian John Cassian, which in English translation reads as follows, the letter teaches events, allegory what you should believe, tropology what you should do, and anagogy where you should aim. At the first of these four levels, the literal sense, the word of God is conceived here as being expressed in the ordinary human words and their ordinary communicative intent. So all the things we were thinking about in the first lecture. Collectively, the last three levels, allegorical, tropological, anagogical, could be regarded together as comprising the spiritual sense. At these levels, God was understood or could be understood to be saying something rather different from what any human author originally meant. And these three are often referred to in shorthand simply under the heading allegorical because they have in common an interest in what is other, Greek allos, other than the literal, what is allegedly hidden in the text rather than what is clear. A strong preference for this spiritual sense, grounded in allegorical rather than literal reading, especially with respect to Old Testament scripture, a strong preference for this developed in many parts of the church in the course of the Middle Ages, and this kind of reading is evidently undergoing something of a revival in certain quarters of the Protestant church in our present moment. Ironically, just as Roman Catholic biblical interpretation, as officially mandated in the church, has steadily been abandoning it over the last several decades and embracing what can only be described as substantially magisterial reformation positions on these matters. History is an interesting thing. As to what these Reformation positions were, there can be no doubt. The magisterial reformers could be strident in their opposition to allegorical reading, especially when it was premised on the idea that the perusal of Scripture would not merely be useless but even injurious unless it were drawn out into allegories. That's Calvin. This is, in Calvin's view, an error. He says that in his commentary on 1st and 2nd Corinthians, an error that, quote, has been the source of many evils. In his earlier life as a monk, Martin Luther had been very attached to allegorical reading, but he came to believe that it led Bible readers to miss the sense of Christ in Scripture, even as they believed they had penetrated right to the heart of it. Reflecting on his earlier life, he says in his lectures on Genesis, it was very difficult for me to break away from my habitual zeal for allegory, and yet I was aware that allegories were empty speculations and the froth, as it were, of the Holy Scriptures. It is the historical sense alone which supplies the true and sound doctrine. Recognizing that the allegorical approach had significant roots in the post-apostolic church, Luther nevertheless believed that the allegorical methods with which Origen or Jerome sought to bring the Old Testament to the level of Christian taste and spirit, in reality gave it the two de gras. The allegorical interpretation killed the spiritual sense of the Old Testament. Martin Luther. <clears throat> 
For Luther, the true spiritual sense was none other than the literal sense. The word of God has a sure, simple, and unequivocal meaning upon which our faith may be built without wavering. He says, it is the one simplest meaning which we call the written one or the literal meaning of the tongue, he says. John Calvin shared Luther's distaste for spiritual reading that departed from the literal sense. For him, earlier Christians like Origen had seized the occasion of torturing scripture in every possible manner away from the true sense. They concluded that the literal sense is too mean and poor and that under the outer bark of the letter there lurk deeper mysteries which cannot be extracted but by beating out allegories. And this they had no difficulty in accomplishing for speculations which appear to be ingenious have always been preferred and always will be preferred to the world, by the world, to solid doctrine. That's his commentary to the Galatians and, uh, on, on Galatians and Ephesians. Calvin believed that Bible readers ought to have more reverence for the text than was displayed in such readings by people that he rather robustly referred to as empty-headed creatures who in reading allegorically change dogs into men, trees into angels, and convert the whole of scripture into an amusing game, end quote. So the reformers unsurprisingly sought to sweep away all other senses of the biblical text, the absurdities of which in the church's past, as they saw it, they spent much energy in declaiming in favor of the literal or historical sense, which they could also refer to as the simple, the genuine, or the natural sense. This is not to say, by the way, that Luther himself never ever allegorized, but then I have perfectly sober friends who allegorize from time to time as well, even though they know better. So I'm not going to name names. Now, obviously, the reformers' opponents pushed back pretty robustly in the other direction. The Jesuit theologian Robert Bellarmine, a very important figure of the Counter-Reformation, writing in the aftermath of the Council of Trent, reiterated the medieval model of the four senses in the course of arguing that while in a human document, words and sentences could indeed only have one meaning, words and sentences in the Bible could have many meanings. The question of which of these, these many meanings was authorized by the Holy Spirit, he said, could only be decided by the church. And the Council of Trent, of course, is very much on the same lines. Only the church can be the judge of the true meaning and interpretation of the sacred scriptures, said Trent. Whereas the reformers could be critical of church fathers like Origen, for those who gathered at Trent, those same church fathers were examples to be followed. The church fathers in turn claimed only to be following the apostles in the way that they approached biblical interpretation, merely exploring the implications of the apostle Paul's comment in 2 Corinthians 3 verse 6 that the letter kills but the spirit gives life. Origen in particular frequently claimed to find in Paul's use of the verb allegoreo in Galatians 4 verse 24 as well as his practice elsewhere in these phenomena to find justification for his own, Origen's own, allegorical reading of biblical narrative. So now we come to a large question. Were the reformers justified in their rejection of senses in the biblical text other than the literal sense? Were they justified in their criticism of church fathers like Origen for their fondness for these other senses, did they thereby step out of line with the Christian tradition of biblical interpretation going all the way back to the apostles and even to our Lord himself? These are the questions I want to discuss in this lecture. In addressing them, I want to dwell for a moment once again on the definition of words. Earlier this morning, I offered the view that typological reading is best regarded as a kind of literal reading. But many people want to collapse the typological and the allegorical together into one kind of approach to scripture. So the first question is, is there a legitimate basis for a distinction 
between literal reading that embraces the typological and the figurative on the one hand and allegorical reading on the other. I think that there is a legitimate basis for this distinction and indeed I think it's very important to make a distinction here. In the words of John O'Keefe and Rusty Reno, typological reading is, quote, about discerning patterns within and between discrete events depicted within scripture. That's how they define typological reading. Allegory, they say, quote, is more fluid and ambitious. It seeks patterns and establishes diverse links between scripture and a range of intellectual, spiritual, and moral concerns. Now, they're actually arguing for spiritual reading, but this is their distinction nonetheless between typological and allegorical. To put this in Dan Trier's language, typological reading, you remember, involves iconic mimesis, which preserves a narrative coherence between reference, but Trier defines allegorical reading as symbolic mimesis, and this is a quote, which arbitrarily imposes a thoroughly ahistorical connection. Now, I have no doubt that some in the room will want to quibble with the word arbitrary in this definition, since allegorical reading can certainly possess method. What is clear, though, is that the two kinds of reading really are very different from each other. Typological reading is literal reading in a sense that we cannot plausibly ascribe to allegorical reading, because typological reading makes connections that internally illuminate the Bible as one coherent story, presenting its distinctive view of the world, whereas allegorical reading obscures those internal connections in making sense of texts that have been resituated within alien cultures and conceptual frameworks. As a matter of fact, that's Kevin Van Hooser, my buddy, again, on that last uh, bit of wording there. Now, the reformers themselves certainly took this view and pursued this same distinction. As Catherine Green McCrate says of Calvin, for example, there is clearly a distinction in Calvin's mind between a valid and useful figurative reading and one which is a violation of proper interpretation. He does use the term allegory to indicate this violation, violation and distinguishes this from the genuine sense. Now, just to put some uh, flesh on the bones of this, um, a very good illustration of the difference I'm after here is provided by the way that the Apostle Paul reads Genesis in Galatians chapter 4, with respect to Abraham, Sarah, and Hagar, when compared with how Philo of Alexandria reads Genesis in his various writings. This example is particularly important when it comes to the question of whether the New Testament itself warrants Bible readers in reading Scripture allegorically. This is, in many ways, the key passage, precisely because Paul employs the Greek verb allegoreo in offering his reading of Genesis in this text. So, this, uh, this passage has served historically as something of a proof text in favor of the allegorical reading of Scripture, and Origen, I think I mentioned earlier, fairly constantly resorts to it when he's justifying his own way of doing things. But the question is, is Paul doing anything remotely similar to what Philo is doing? That's the question. The short answer, I believe, is that he is not doing anything remotely similar. Here is Philo writing about the Genesis story in his work uh, entitled On Mating, which sounds like a great book. This is what he says. When you hear that Hagar was afflicted by Sarah, you must not suppose that any of those things befell her which arise from rivalry and quarrels among women. For the question is not here about women, but about minds. The one being practiced in the branches of elementary instruction, the other being devoted to the labors of virtue. Right? So you must not suppose you should read this in a normal way about stuff that we know about. Actually, it's about other stuff entirely. 
And in this one, and elsewhere in Philo, uh, when, when Philo is referring to this passage, Hagar represents the academic disciplines that must be attended to while the soul is journeying towards wisdom and truth. But after we get enlightened, that is, after the birth of Isaac, the attainment of enlightenment, these academic disciplines can be dispensed with. Sarah, in these readings, represents virtue, the wife of Abraham, who is the mind. The guys are always the mind, by the way, just want to point that out. In other words, the Genesis story is read by Philo in order to illustrate Greek philosophical and ethical norms. That's what he's using the text to do. Nothing in the Old Testament story remotely justifies such interpretive moves. Nor is the Old Testament story important in itself for Philo as these moves are being made. Sarah and Hagar, as characters in that story, are quite unimportant. How does Paul approach this story, on the other hand, in Galatians 4? In Galatians 4, Paul draws an analogy between what was true back in the time of the patriarchs and what is true in the present. He's not so much interested in correlating this with that as he is in correlating then with now. The temporal nature of the connection is particularly clear in Galatians 4 verse 29, which speaks about what happened at that time and what is happening now. So at that time, the son born in the ordinary way, what is happening now, it is the same now. Right? That's the move that's being made. Now is the moment when these things are being interpreted allegorically. That's the precise sense of that Greek passive participle. It's not that for Paul the Genesis story is really about something other than the lives of Abraham's family members. For example, the journey of the individual soul or even the present experience of the Galatian church. On the contrary, the Genesis story is, is about Abraham's family members but it is also of relevance to the Galatians because the two women who stand at the center of Paul's interest are each associated in Genesis with promises that God makes about offspring. In Sarah's case, this promise is explicitly connected in Genesis with the language of covenant through her marriage to Abraham. In Hagar's case, it is not explicitly connected, but the language in which the promise of God is articulated certainly invites the reader of Genesis to make that same connection. So it is quite in line with the Genesis story's own narrative shape to say that these two women represent two covenants and that these covenants concern sons born first in the normal way, Ishmael, and secondly in accordance with God's promise and miraculously Isaac. The relevance of the Genesis story to the Galatian Christians is that those who believe are children of Abraham, Galatians 3 verse 7, and such believers should not become confused about their identity as children of the free woman, children of the promise. Therefore, the Galatians are encouraged to act like Abraham, their father, in his response to Sarah's instruction to get rid of the slave woman and her son. So what is Paul doing here? I would suggest he's doing nothing other than he does everywhere else in his letters. He reads the Old Testament scriptures before him literally, allowing the larger context always to inform his reading of the particular text, which in this case leads him to bring together two Old Testament ways of speaking about God's chosen people over against outsiders. They are the children of Abraham and Sarah, and in this passage, they are also the children of Mother Zion. The Galatian Christians need to remember in which great story they find themselves, of which family they are members, that is, the family of Abraham and Sarah, not Hagar, the inhabitants of the New Jerusalem, not the Old. So I would propose that Paul is reading literally. He's reading typologically and figuratively in terms of the understanding of those uh, uh, terms that I articulated earlier. What he's doing is engaging in Hans Fry's words in literalism at the level of the whole biblical story, 
interpreting the Old Testament text as, Fry again, a common narrative referring to a single history and its pattern of meaning, without detriment to, Hans Fry, literal meaning or specific temporal reference in the earlier biblical text. All of this fits Fry's definition of literal reading perfectly. Paul is not doing anything remotely similar to Philo in his Bible reading. And ancient writers like John Chrysostom already understood this. Chrysostom argues that in in Galatians 4, Paul pursues a customary typological approach to the Old Testament while referring to it, unhelpfully as it turns out, using the verb allegoreo. Here are Chrysostom's words from his commentary on Galatians. Contrary to normal usage, Paul here calls a type an allegory. His meaning is as follows. This history not only declares that which appears in the face of it, but announces somewhat farther whence it is called an allegory, and what hath it announced no less than all things now present. So what Chrysostom is saying is really is this, that allegory in Galatians 4 does not signify with respect to Paul's approach to the Old Testament, what it signifies for Philo and later Alexandrian Christian scholars like Clement and Origen. What Chrysostom is suggesting is that the language here signifies the kind of typological figurative reading that I earlier suggested is best understood as literal and canonical. Um, So this is not a a new discussion, as it were. And of course, it does go back earlier to my earlier discussion about you can go to lexicons and so on, that's fine, but you've also got to pay attention to what the word appears to mean in this context here. This is why I think it's unwise, actually, for people to translate that verb in this context using words like allegory or allegorize. Uh, The old King James does that. The NRSV does it. The ESV does it, actually. Those who have translated allegoreo, I propose, using different words, have been right to do so. Because even Lowe and Nita's full definition in their lexicon gives you a pretty broad semantic range at this point. To employ an analogy or likeness in communicating. To speak allegorically, to employ an analogy, to use a likeness. That's the full definition. And you'll see it actually contains everything I've put under typology, figuration, and allegory. So the NIV, I think, is better. These things may be taken figuratively. And the New King James, interestingly, uh, departs from the Old King James. I can imagine a world in which allegorical interpretation has not predominantly come to mean the kind of thing that Philo did and the kind of thing that later Christians influenced by Philo did. In such an imagined world, it might be possible without confusion inevitably arising to render allegory in Galatians 4 using the English verb allegorize. But in the real world in which we live, as Stephen Dumate says, when we think of allegory, we naturally envision the brand of allegory practiced by Philo and the Stoics. In this real world, confusion inevitably arises when allegory is used for what Paul is doing in Galatians 4, the confusion is rife, it is of great posterity, and we really ought to depart from it. As Paul reads the Old Testament here in Galatians, so, I propose, he and other New Testament authors generally read it elsewhere in their writings. None of them, I suggest, but I don't have time to develop this argument here today, None of them read remotely in the manner of Philo, and I would say that's true even of the author of Hebrews. Their reading is predominantly, if not entirely, literal, I propose, by which I mean it's attentive to the apparent communicative intentions of Old Testament scripture as a document from the past, taking full account of the nature of the language in which these intentions are embedded, and reveal this components of Scripture's unfolding covenantal story. And by the way, memorize that, and the next time somebody uses the word literal, give that back to them. It will stop them in their tracks. Do you believe in reading the text literally? I do. Here's the paragraph we now need to discuss. It would really help us all a lot. Writers like Philo, and here I'm quoting Copeland and Strook's book on allegory, deploy 
quote, a hermeneutic aimed at the transcendent truths which are concealed in language. That's a general definition beyond biblical studies, actually. But the apostles are not interested in truth that's concealed in Old Testament language. They're interested in truth that's revealed in Old Testament language. They don't regard the spiritual sense of the Old Testament as being located somewhere else than in the literal sense. They regard, as far as I can see, the one sense as being intrinsically connected to the other. And in all of this, the apostles were unsurprisingly following the lead of our Lord himself in passages like Luke chapter 24, the story of the two disciples on the Emmaus Road. Here, it is evident what Jesus' post-resurrection words were not. Here is what Jesus did not say. Dear disciples, happily, I can now tell you what the prophets really meant underneath the veil of ordinary language, which you were quite understandably unable to penetrate by yourselves until this very moment. That's not what Jesus said. What did he say? How foolish you are, how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. They should have known. The meaning of the prophetic words was not difficult to discern. It was not concealed. So the truth of the matter is that patristic appeals to the New Testament as warrant for allegorical reading rest, in my view, on very flimsy foundations indeed. Whence then did allegorical reading really derive? The answer to this question is not difficult to discern. The allegorical reading of literature is first documented in ancient Greece, where in Copland and Strook's words, it arises out of a quest to find, quote, mystical truths and cultic significance embedded in the poetic language and the figures of myth, end quote. This was very importantly the case in the poetry of Homer. And Simon Goldhill explains why. Homer, he says, ah, there we are. This is just a summary of what I'm going to say. I have a longer quote. Homer, he says, held a privileged place in Greek and Athenian culture. His was the first text learnt and most studied at all levels of Greek education, and any educated Athenian could be expected to have a knowledge of it. Homer was also a prime source of authority for knowledge, behavior, and ethics. The Homeric texts were essential not only to the actual process of teaching and to the festival institutions of Athens, but also to the makeup of Athenian social attitudes and understanding. Even though Athenian religion did not have sacred texts, it is with some justification that Homer has been called the Greek Bible, especially if one thinks, for example, of the use of the Bible in Victorian Britain, read after dinner or used in schools, a subject of heated academic debate a cultural background widely diffused through different echelons of society, a much quoted source of moral and social guidance. End of long quote. The Homer Homeric literature was very important to Greek culture. To be a Greek was to live life in Homer's shadow, to be immersed in his writings, and to look to him as an authority. The problem was that Greek society in the 5th and 4th centuries BC, and particularly Athenian society, had already moved on since Homer's time, and his poetry, while retaining massive cultural authority, had become to some degree problematic. Increasingly, educated Greeks found his portrayals of the gods troubling. These deities appeared to be very similar to human beings, and as measured by the ethical standards of the time in which the critics lived, the gods did not appear to be very virtuous characters. So what was to be done with this now embarrassing, important, authoritative text? The ideal solution in Plato's mind was simply to ban the reading of the Homeric epics. Uh, being a person of totalitarian tendencies, it's not surprising that Plato would have come up with that solution. Another more practical solution was simply to encourage people to read Homer in a different way. Perhaps Homer could be read, perhaps his texts could be read 
not in accordance with their literal sense, but in some other way, so that they could retain their authority as a kind of scripture. Perhaps they could be read as really being about physics and psychology. Theagenes of Regium proposed that. Or maybe they could be read as really being about ethics, ethics, Anaxagoras, or about history, Euhemeros, or perhaps they're really about geography, Strabo. When the gods fight with each other, maybe this is really about the struggles of the soul, the dispositions of the soul. Maybe the names of the gods could be read as dispositions of the soul, and so on and so forth. This is where allegorical reading begins in the ancient world, so far as we know. It arises out of the shared conviction among its advocates that Homer's work in particular cannot be impious or improper. It just cannot be. If it appears to be, then the correct meaning has not yet been arrived at. Right? You see the move that's being made here. It lies under the surface somewhere. The poet has only hinted at it and we have not yet seen it. This perspective was picked up in the 4th and 3rd centuries by the early Stoics and then by later ones like Heraclitus of Alexandria. Just how embarrassing and problematic Homer had become by the 1st century AD is well illustrated in the opening lines of Heraclitus' work entitled Homeric Problems. When, when you call a whole work that, you, you know you have a problem. Here's what he says. Is that the right text? I can't see. Yes, we're good, I think. It is a weighty and damaging charge that heaven brings against Homer for his disrespect for the divine. If he meant nothing allegorically, he was impious through and through. And sacrilegious fables loaded with blasphemous folly run riot through both epics. You get a sense of what the stakes are here. Heraclitus holds particularly strong beliefs about the true nature of the world, the gods, the virtuous life. Homer does not measure up. Heraclitus' allegorical reading is designed to help Homer to improve himself. By the time we reach the first century AD then, there is already a well-established method of reading ancient authoritative texts in the Greco-Roman world that have become difficult and embarrassing from the point of view of their readers. It is this same method that the Jewish Philo employs in the first century AD to handle a quite different problem from the one that Heraclitus has. Philo's challenge is not to read Homer in ways that make sense to, do not offend, educated Greek opinion. Philo's challenge is to read the Jewish scriptures in a way that doesn't offend educated Greek opinion, and most especially the Jewish Torah, which in first century Alexandria, in, in Greek translation, would have played a very similar role in Jewish education to the role that Homer played in Greek education. So here again we have revered, authoritative texts, but now, unfortunately, somewhat difficult and embarrassing. And Philo sets out, by way of allegorical reading, to reveal to the contemporary detractors of Judaism all the many ways in which the Jewish scriptures, against all appearances, are consistent with prevailing Greco-Roman philosophical and ethical norms. It is these norms, whether borrowed from Plato or the Stoics or whoever, that drive Philo's entire hermeneutical enterprise. It is in their light that Philo radically reshapes his scriptures so that they can be understood as saying only what is considered rational and virtuous in the prevailing culture. It's not from his scriptures that Philo derives the idea, for example, that the body is an evil and dead thing. It's from Plato. It's from Plato and not from his scriptures that Philo gets the idea that human souls once descended into the material realm and are designed to fly back to an immaterial realm later, and that philosophical contemplation is the key that unlocks the prison door to allow the soul's escape. And Philo's ethics owe considerably more to Stoic than to biblical ethics. 
They are in turn bound up with a view of God as impassable that is impossible convincingly to ground in Scripture. It is fundamentally the Greeks whom Philo is reading in his reading of the Bible. It's not really Scripture at all. Scripture is, represents merely an obstacle that he must overcome on his way to a quite different destination. So this is where allegorical reading comes from. And from the beginning, these are the things that allegorical reading was designed to achieve long before it was picked up and developed so extensively by Philo's Alexandrian Christian successors, Clement and Origen. And now we begin to see more clearly why we ought to be concerned about allegorical reading, just as the reformers insisted we should be. It's not just that apostolic authority cannot convincingly be appealed to as a warrant for this kind of reading, although that is true, I think. But more than that, the practice itself inevitably threatens to undermine the authority of Scripture, the very ability of Scripture to address us in its own voice and to hold us to account about both our beliefs and our actions. The process has typically begun with Old Testament Scripture, where it has been suggested that there is a significant gap between the communicative intention of a human author and the communicative intention of God, and that we need to read the Old Testament in a special way in order to hear God's voice. But if the Holy Spirit can operate in this way in Old Testament texts, why not in other ones? Why not in all the scriptures, including the apostolic writings? Perhaps what God really wants to say to us is hidden beneath the surface of all of them and cannot be grasped by ordinary attention to ordinary human language at all. Perhaps what God really wants to say looks quite different from what appears on the surface of biblical texts everywhere. The further we press the agenda of this kind of spiritual Bible reading, the more we recognize the seriousness of the threat. And who exactly is to say how far the agenda is or is not to be pressed? Once the allegorical train leaves the station and starts running along its tracks, where will it be forced to stop and by whom? The author of the text cannot fulfill this role since he was never informed about the departure of the train in the first place, as you can see from this slide. The author is quite powerless to prevent any manner of deep meanings being found in this text. And if the train runs far enough without interference, any text, however authoritative it might once have been, will inevitably end up saying in its entirety what another newly authoritative text is saying. And about that newly authoritative text, by the way, one thing can be said with complete certainty, even before it is written, that the new text will only be subject to literal reading. Not a breath of allegory will disturb its literal tranquility. For throughout history and down to the present time, one never finds readers allegorizing genuinely authoritative texts to which they ascribe primary authority, even if they pretend otherwise. Such a fate only befalls texts that require domesticating, which is why one of the great puzzles that I have with some of my colleagues is, how is it that all the church fathers get to be read literally and the New Testament gets to be read literally and so do Augustine and Calvin, and the only exception, it turns out, is the Old Testament. Does that seem slightly strange to you? It does to me. I have rather strong feelings about that. This fate only befalls texts that require domesticating. That's where the method began. Texts that need to be made to say something against their grain in a narrative that's alien to them. Allegorizing only occurs in the words of O'Keefe and Reno when, as they say, when the literal meaning of a text is seen to run in a wrong or unhelpful direction when the reader is unhappy with the literal meaning, end quote. And of course, wrong and unhelpful in this sentence are measured in terms of where the real authority lies, which is somewhere else. In relation to somewhere else, this is wrong and unhelpful, right? So it was in the beginning, 
when allegorical reading was first invented in order to subjugate an old text, Homer, to a largely new one, Plato, so it is now, as John Thompson puts it, to construct an allegory or to read allegorically is certainly also to express one's own ideology and worldview in conscious or unconscious dialogue with or perhaps in opposition to the text from which one's allegory is ostensibly drawn. Allegory, says David Dawson, is not so much about the meaning or lack of meaning in text as it is a way of using texts and their meanings to situate oneself and one's community with respect to society and culture. Now, a certain degree of awareness of this threat among Christians is already apparent in patristic times. It is apparent even though so many of the Christian leaders of those early centuries had been educated in classically Hellenistic ways, and even though the appropriateness, at least to some degree, of allegorical reading seemed to them to be self-evident. That's how they'd been taught to read ancient texts. In spite of that, we do encounter some awareness of the problem I'm now talking about. For example, in Theodore of Mopsuestia's negative comments about spiritual interpretation, which he sees as rendering the scriptures incomprehensible and meaningless. So he's rigorously opposed to origin and originists. But even Didymus the Blind, a devoted follower of origin, who allegorizes constantly in his own teaching, even Didymus recognizes the threat because he insists that the cross of Christ at least cannot be subject to this treatment. If the cross is allegorized, he says, the resurrection has to be allegorized too. But if the resurrection is allegorized, everything that took place is like a dream. Well, precisely, but who stopped the train just there? The later Jerome likewise insists that spiritual interpretation must follow the sequence of history. It's against this background, toward the end of a patristic period in which quite a few writers give the impression of deciding where the train stops quite arbitrarily, it's in this context that Augustine's On Christian Doctrine tries to formulate guidelines for scripture reading. The first of the fathers systematically to attempt to devise rules about where the allegorical train should begin and end the journey. Augustine, in this work, is a very strong advocate of reading Scripture according to its literal sense. So when he's actually thinking this through methodologically, he's very much on the side of literal reading. Readers, he said, should resist the temptation to evade the imperatives of the text by appealing to a non-literal sense. He observes, in fact, in that work, that people often appeal to the allegorical sense when they want to avoid the plain meaning of the text. So he's very aware of this issue that we're now uh, discussing. Only when it proves impossible, he says, to read individual texts literally in line with the thrust of the whole story, only then might you be allowed, as it were, to read in a different way. So Augustine has a, a very strong intuition about the potentially injurious effects of spiritual reading on the authority of scripture, and he tries to rein it in. One senses in these various comments from the fathers the merest glimpse on the far horizon of the mystical chorus in the final scene of Goethe's Faust. All that is transitory is only an allegory. One senses a patristic awareness of what any concession to such thoroughgoing hermeneutical Platonism would mean for historic Christian faith. That is its end, its demise, its oblivion. So the church fathers were somewhat aware of the problem we're discussing, but it's only with the benefit of hindsight, I think, as readers who do not now share directly in the pagan Greco-Roman inheritance into which they were all inducted by upbringing and education. It's only now looking back that we can fully recognize the seriousness of the problem. 
It's only now that time has passed that we can look back and see the numerous ways in which Scripture's ability to function authoritatively, both in patristic times and in the Middle Ages, was not merely threatened by allegorical reading, but actually compromised by it. Handled in this way, Scripture could not effectively challenge its readers. The literal sense could all too easily be ignored but it conflicted with favored prevailing ideas and ethical norms. A spiritual reading could all too easily be found that conformed to prevailing ethical and cultural norms. Under such circumstances, scripture could not function as an entity that to quote 2 Timothy 3 is, remember, God breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. For that to be true, certain other things have to be so. Right? Paying attention to Scripture's communicative intent has to be at the core. Thomas Aquinas may well wish to claim in the 13th century that nothing necessary to faith is contained under the spiritual sense that's not elsewhere put forward by the Scripture in the literal sense, but the fact is that a significant amount of what is represented as authentic Christian belief in patristic literature and in medieval literature is not obviously grounded in Scripture, read in its literal sense at all. The idea that the body is less important than the soul, that marriage is less worthy than celibacy, that erotic desire and passion are problematic and must be suppressed, that the goal of existence is the ascent of the soul to God, such ideas, to name just a few, do not emerge, I propose, from a literal reading of Scripture, but they are to be found deeply rooted in the Christian tradition. It's not from Scripture, which teaches us that it was when God formed bodies out of the dust of the ground and breathed into them the breath of life that we became living souls. It's not from Scripture that the patristic body-soul dichotomy arises. It's not from Scripture that there arise the principled hierarchies of soul and body, celibacy and marriage, and indeed spiritual and literal reading that we encounter in much pre-Reformation Christian literature. It is not from Scripture that we get the notion of the spiritual life as a staged ascent of the soul to God. For these ideas to flourish, Scripture must be read in ways that its human authors, not being Greeks themselves, cannot be shown to have intended. For this to work, Neoplatonic patriarchs must be found in the text, who in spite of a deafening lack of textual evidence on the point, allegedly never delighted in sexual intercourse with their wives because the passions are wrong. Patriarchs must be found who correspond indeed to Neoplatonic ideals in every respect. Even if this means portraying Jacob as Ambrose did, as a wise man living a happy life because he pursued reason and possessed a clear conscience. Well, go to Genesis. Above all else on this kind of view, it must never be considered for a moment that a text like Song of Songs might be challenging the correctness of any preconceptions held by scripture readers about sex and marriage. It must never be possible that scripture might be useful for teaching, rebuking, and so on, on such matters. Nor was it widely considered for hundreds and hundreds of years after origin, even though the Song of Songs was one of the most read biblical texts in medieval Europe. Why was it never considered it might have something to say about this? Because everyone already knew it couldn't. That's why. So, into the significant gap between the voice of the human author and the voice of God, opened up by Bible readers in the post-apostolic church, devoted to allegorical reading, into that gap came a considerable number of ideas that cannot be grounded in the literal sense of the biblical text, even though all of those people in some way would have said the literal sense was the foundational sense. Scripture itself resists all these ideas, I propose, but they entered into mainstream Christian discourse nevertheless. How is that possible? It's possible because, whereas texts read literally 
can, like dogs, bite back at the reader, challenging his or her current ideas. Texts read spiritually cannot bite back. The ideas in question that I'm arguing came into the gap are, moreover, neither marginal nor trivial. In the examples I cited, they go right to the heart of what it means to be a human being and how best to live our lives in pursuit of God-ordained goals. These are central matters of concern in biblical faith. Particularly on these crucial matters pertaining to core Christian faith, one might have hoped, to quote Aquinas, that more of the church fathers would have found in Scripture, contained under the spiritual sense, only that which is elsewhere put forward in the literal sense. One would have hoped that even if they did believe the apostles occasionally indulged to some small degree in non-literal reading, that even so, they would have been more alert than they were to the dangers of attempting more such reading. Evidently, this was not the case. They were not so aware. And to that extent, wittingly or not, the church fathers undermined the authority of Scripture, including the authority of the apostles, even as they appealed to it. So did many of those who followed them in the Middle Ages, often unaware of the extent to which a very significant gap had now opened up between Scripture and tradition. Of course, they were unaware of it because they had very limited access to Scripture in its original languages and context, but they also had very limited access to the fathers, whom they usually encountered only in heavily edited form in the Middle Ages. Even the great Renaissance scholar Erasmus of Rotterdam in the 16th century knew of no other way than allegory to gain meaning from large parts of the Old Testament. In fact, uh, he found the literal meaning we read to be senseless, repulsive, and ridiculous, which is not exactly subordinating yourself to God's word, I would have thought. The absurdity of the hermeneutical approach that produced such significant distortions of biblical theology while destroying Scripture's ability to address that very problem. The absurdity of this was not lost on one of patristic Christianity's earliest and fiercest critics, the late third century Neoplatonist philosopher Porphyry. Porphyry said this, some persons desiring to find a solution to the baseness of the Jewish Scriptures rather than abandon them, have had recourse to explanations inconsistent and incongruous with the words written, which explanations, instead of supplying a defense of the foreigners, contain rather approval and praise of themselves. For they boast that the plain words of Moses are enigmas and regard them as oracles full of hidden mysteries. And having bewildered the mental judgment by folly, they make their explanations. Now, I don't agree with everything Porphyry said. Um, but I think on this point, I do. To demonstrate the absurdity of providing such explanations inconsistent and incongruous with the words written, Porphyry, rather tongue-in-cheek, I think, proposed applying the Christian allegorical method to the struggle between Achilles and Hector in the Iliad, portraying this as a struggle between Christ, Achilles, and Satan, Hector, in the manner of the Christian commentators. And indeed, why not? In Porphyry's view, Origen had foisted Greek conceptions on foreign myths. Why not instead foist Christian conceptions on Greek myths? Where does the train stop? And so we come to the conclusion. The reformers well understood that the long Christian tradition of reading scripture non-literally lacked apostolic warrant. The reformers also comprehended how it undermined authority, the authority of, and even respect for Scripture. Scripture could too easily come to be understood, not so much as the very Word of God, as the apostles believed it to be, the loftiest and noblest of holy things, in Martin Luther's words. Scripture could too easily come simply to be regarded as an embarrassing problem to be solved by subtle hermeneutical maneuvers. By the beginning of the 16th century, the reformers themselves had accumulated many more examples of the ways in which this was a problem 
than were even conceivable at the end of the fifth century. In the fifth century, the full potential of spiritual reading of scripture's enigmas for validating all sorts of beliefs and practices in the church that were not justifiable on the basis of the literal sense, that full potential had not yet been realized. But the reformers perceived clearly that the very nature of Christian faith was at stake in this question of how should we read, as well as the question of access to the faith. Could anyone other than elite Bible readers possessing esoteric knowledge, capable of penetrating those labyrinths in which others show off their talents, Philip Melanchthon's words, could anyone other than those people on this view grasp hold of genuine Christian faith? That was the question they asked. In these respects, the reformers were, in general, perhaps a little more astute than some of their Protestant successors, who have managed to give the impression that it's a matter of relative indifference whether or not reformed Christians should engage in the non-literal reading of the Bible. But I propose that the reformers were quite correct to reject such reading, and in doing so, actually, they drew on much of what earlier writers like Theodore and Augustine had already said about it. Even if their patristic practice did not necessarily always follow through in the implications of their theoretical hermeneutical discussions. It's not the reformers in taking up such a position who departed from apostolic tradition, but as they claimed, it was the others before them in taking up their position who in some measure or another stepped away from apostolic tradition, and I don't believe that's what we should be doing. Thanks very much. Okay, we have time for questions again. I should also say that uh, at the end of this uh, Q&A uh, time at noon, uh, we have a uh, community lunch um, at the other side of this building where the coffee hour was, to which everyone is invited. Uh, lunch is provided. So um, we can um, join um, Dr. Proven there as well. All right, does anyone have a question? Hi, um, I'm Hannah. I teach uh, church history in my area of patristics. Your enemies, no. Um, so, so if it sounds like, well, if, if it's the case that beginning as early as the Apostolic Fathers until the 16th century, the church really got, went off the rails, right, bringing, introducing foreign, non, unscriptural elements into Christianity through their allegorical or non-literal non readings. Um, and so that, at the same time, it's during this period that much of the core of Christian doctrine in terms of you know, fourth century Trinitarian debates um, is worked out, at least for most, most traditions, right? They give Nicaea as a privileged interpretation of scripture. So um, what then is the implication for, let's just say Trinitarian theology, but for the theological developments that are based on interpretation of scripture, yeah. uh, if it's an invalid Sure. Way of interpreting. It's a great question. The reformers already had to address that question, of course, because they were dealing with people to their left. And some of those people were indeed abandoning the doctrine of the Trinity, in particular, on the basis that it wasn't biblical. Right? So they were already thinking about this question. And their answer was, sure, we agree with core tradition. Sure, we agree with the Nicene Creed. No problem with any of that. And of course, we're not saying that everything that Christians have been writing about and preaching and all the rest of that for the entirety of these centuries, that everything is wrong, of course not. And they would say, and indeed, look, we're still continuing lots of things. We're, we're, in fact, they're going to trouble for this. We're still doing infant baptism. Look, we're in the tradition. And other people say, exactly, that's all. You know, but they themselves uh, offered discriminating commentary on this stuff. And that's what my answer would be as well. It's not an all or nothing game, it seems to me. But given that apostolic tradition is agreed to be the foundation for everything we do, it is reasonable for each of us to hold each other accountable to that question. And um, 
uh, you know, so Calvin takes a, a very stringent line on Servetus, for example, precisely on this basis, that you simply can't do that, as it were. You can't just say, well, I'm, reading, I'm just reading the Bible and the doctrine of the Trinity is now, is now out or whatever. Um, so I, I would say exactly the same thing, that what we're looking for is a discriminating, it's not an anti-tradition stance, it is a critically friendly sifting process where even within individual church fathers, one can recognize Augustine's strengths and weaknesses, the things he said which were likely true and to be believed and the things he said which likely are not. Um, I don't think we have um, any viable alternative to that critical engagement actually. Um, so it would become a problem if you really did think the Nicene Creed was out of step with the apostolic doctrine, but I see no reason to believe that, actually. Um, so it's not a problem for me, anyway. But um, given, that the, given that our Lord himself gives us the Old Testament scriptures as our canon for measuring faith and ethics, and given that he commissions his apostles to, to have the same gatekeeping role, and given that the writings they produce are then seen to be their legacy that protects that role, I would have thought we we're on eminently safe and important ground when we insist that's exactly what we should do. And that's what the reformers thought, I believe, the magisterial reformers anyway. Feel free to come back though uh, on that. Would you like to, no? Yeah, okay, we can open it up. You can come back at lunch or later, yeah. Hello, my name is Dean. I'm a MDiv student here at the seminary. Um, my question, uh, I guess, kind of ties both of your lectures here together um, and is at its heart a pastoral question. Um, of course, Luther, when he um, pointed to sola scriptura on the basis of perspicuity, he was not doing this purely for academic purposes. He had very pastoral intentions behind this. He wanted people to actually grasp what the scripture really meant Absolutely. and believed that uh, through careful study that that literal meaning of the text could come out. Now, of course, with the allegorical interpretations, um, the danger there is that you are essentially butchering that literal interpretation and butchering what the text really means and that original communicative intent. Right. Um, so, which brings me to my question. It seems like in the, like in the modern world now, today, we have a similar kind of danger that has kind of masked itself um, in that you often hear the axiom, the Bible says it, so I believe it, which is essentially, it seems like to me, a postmodern reading of the Bible, whatever it says that I think it says will be what it says, but it is actually masking itself as a literal translation of the Bible. So how do we encounter this in our churches in a way that actually brings people back to a hungering for Scripture in such uh, a way that they actually want to get um, behind just this very surface level reading of the text, which in effect does not um, just simply put faith to the text, but it is actually butchering it and turning it into whatever I want it to mean. Very good. Um, picking up on your lovely metaphor of butchering, I'm going to offer a surgical intervention here rather than a band-aid. The fundamental problem we face here is the woefully inadequate nature of our Christian educational programs. And until we grasp that nettle and realize the kind of world we live in and how we're doing church at the moment doesn't work, we're not going to make any progress on any of the issues that are then down the road from that, right? Um, most people, and that includes probably most people in this room, we are largely shaped by internet, TV, newspapers, and so on and so forth. That's where most people spend their time. It's how their imaginations are being shaped. It's how their desires are being shaped. It's how they're being catechized. And to think that we can combat that with 20 minute or 30 minute sermons once a week and one Bible study maybe of dubious quality probably in the middle of the week is itself another form of insanity when you say it out loud. It's nonsense. So we can't solve all these various, I mean, the, the problem of um, 
how best to think about hermeneutics is certainly one really important problem, and that's what I've been talking about. It's not the only problem we face, though. Another problem is how do you make people care? <laughs> um, so how, how we are being church is entirely inadequate to deal with the cultural tsunami we are now facing. Um, it might have worked at one time. It probably worked a lot better at one time when what was happening in church buildings was being reinforced in schools and in books and we didn't have the internet or God save us Facebook or what, any, any of the rest of that. So we didn't have this massive permanent deliberate distraction going on, right? We are living in distracted times. We're living in addictive times. We're li living in five second attention span times where many of us can't leave our phones down for longer than that, which is a sure sign you're addicted, by the way. I say that to my daughter. I'm not addicted, dad. I said, show me, put it away. Oh, well, no, maybe not. So. Uh, I think this is a much, much bigger problem, in other words. The reformers, of course, as you rightly alluded to, their response to the situation they found themselves in was to organize literacy for everybody, to set up schools and universities, and to expect everyone to learn Hebrew and Greek. And Martin Butzer said he could envisage a time when the common language of every Christian city in Europe would be Hebrew. And we smile and kind of, you know, because we can't imagine that. It seems so far away. But I have every reason to think that he was serious at the moment he said it. And one of the things you find in the 16th century is a massive upsurge in book sales of books designed to help people learn Hebrew and Greek. Massive book market, which only arises, of course, in response to demand, right? Right. Probably, in the end. I mean, you may try and kickstart it, but eventually it becomes a market because there's a demand, right? And uh, honestly, if, if any of those um, gentlemen were to come back here now and, and look at what we're doing, I, or indeed if the Apostle Paul were to come and look at what we were doing, I think he would, I'm not sure, what he would do, poor fellow? He said, all that traveling around for this is probably what he would say. I, I mean, so... I just think this is a much, much bigger problem that every single one of us has to wrestle with. Every single one of you who's training to, to, to lead churches has to wrestle with. Until a decent level of Christian education is expected as part of your catechizing. Until we get a point where, okay, if somebody leaves school at 16, but at least they then are educated Christianly to that level, until it's regarded as scandalous that somebody with a law degree has a 101 education in scripture and the kind of issues we've been discussing, until that becomes unacceptable, none of this is going to change. And you may have noticed we're not doing too well at the minute, culturally, in the post-Christian world. Why might that be? Well, maybe a lot of this stuff is the reason why that is. So. All right, Jeremy again. Um, I appreciated the um, critique you offered of the early church, uh, or a little bit post-early church, allowing uncritically moral uh, concepts from the culture uh, into the church. Um, and then yet at the same time, I'm aware of how recently in U.S. history it's been the culture that has had to call the church to more moral understanding of our scriptures when I think about slavery and the status of women. Um, so do you think there's a balance between declaring Christian truth, you know, against culture, yet being humble enough to hear the critique of culture when we, that we might be the ones absolutely. that are, are opposing Christ? Yeah. For sure, absolutely. Um, a large part of Christian hermeneutics and Christian epistemology is bound up with appropriate humility, right? I am a time-conditioned person of my own. I must consider constantly the possibility that I am mistaken. I must go back to scripture. I must listen to you when you tell me I'm mistaken. Uh, we don't settle for the soft pluralism we discussed earlier. We take it as a challenge to go and do better. Right? That's absolutely true. And of course, it's also true that uh, at least some Christians, in some cases many Christians, have a lot to apologize for. Right? Nazi Germany, not a great moment of German church history. Uh, the slavery issue, not a great moment for, for much uh, 
Christian practice and thinking. I agree with all of that. I also want to push back a little bit, though, because who was it at the end of the day that actually got rid of slavery? It was people inspired by Christian thinking and biblical thinking. And the culture's critique itself, there's such a loss of cultural memory that people can't even remember where the critique is coming from. So what's the basis of that critique against slavery? The Greeks thought slavery was wonderful. Aristotle thought it was the natural condition of many people to be slaves. So where does this idea that slaves themselves are human beings just like you and me really come from? I'd say it comes from Genesis, the image-bearing idea, right? So not only have Christians often been at the forefront of all of these social changes in fact, including the slavery and women issue, But even beyond that, the critique that's coming from the culture, which they attribute to different sources, in fact, doesn't come from there at all. And of course, one of the great myths that has been built up in order to justify this kind of, it's not about religion, it's about something else, is the idea that really it's the Greco-Romans that are inspiration for all of this social progress. Which, if you actually know anything about Greece and Rome, is a laughable proposition. And yet it's in our textbooks, and I was taught it as a youngster myself. The Greeks and the Romans are great because it was all the enlightenment people could find as an alternative to religion and Bible and stuff, right? So they went to Athens, and Athens apparently was the cradle of democracy. Well, I mean, gosh, really? Well, no, it wasn't really very democratic in the slightest degree. It was only democratic if you were a male adult warrior. Then there was a degree, but the slaves and the women and all that didn't didn't participate in Athenian democracy. So... So while certainly wanting appropriately to recognize where the church has gone wrong, I would also say that the gospel has changed the world beyond recognition in terms of where we began. That if you look at the impact of the gospel on the Roman Empire, it's astonishing, right? Because it was utterly different from the Roman Empire. Utterly transformed people's attitudes to babies, infants, old people, sick people, everything else. So the gospel has transformed the culture, and it's the engine that's driven change for the the better, even where people have not acknowledged it to be the case. That's the bit that we don't want to leave out, because the culture is telling us something different. The culture is telling us that the only thing we should ever be at the moment is ashamed. And I'm saying, no, that's not true. That's not accurate. I'm very proud of all sorts of things, legitimately so, and I recognize that Christians have sometimes done atrocious things. So I just want to tell the truth, and the culture's not going to tell the truth, so we have to, we have to get our cultural memory back. And uh, I don't remember Genghis Khan being too concerned about human rights, for example, you know, and looking after widows and orphans and all that. Where does that come from? Where do we get the idea we look after the weak instead of getting rid of them? The Stoics would have said that was profoundly immoral, right? Uh, Compassion was a major weakness in Greco-Roman thought. It was not a virtue. So where did these ideas come from? Compassion's a big deal in our culture now, right? So where did that idea come from? Is it self-evident, as your great founding document claims? Which, by the way, is one of the greatest bluffs in, in history, I don't want to offend you, but we hold these things to be self-evident. Self-evident to whom exactly? Well, to Christian people is the answer, or to Christianized people. It's not self-evident to people in India or China or most people through history. It was only self-evident to Christianized people. So it's very effective bluff, as, as you can see, because you're sitting here. But honestly, it's a very poor basis for anything. Just to say it's self-evident doesn't settle anything. Sorry, I've been breaking to that it's a bit late in the day, perhaps, to, to make that point, but I just thought um, I, would, I would go out there and take a bit of a risk. <laughs> um, so. Thank you. Uh, if you have further questions to press, come to lunch, and uh, we'll make uh, Dr. Proven work just for his lunch as well. Uh, but let's give him a round of thanks. <laughs>